Our next topic is neuro-ophthalmology. So we've been starting um, here, remember, from muscle, working our way up. And uh, we did cerebellum last time. And in the brainstem and cranial nerve, you notice we didn't spend a lot of time on the optic nerve. And so in this lecture, we're going to pick up on the optic nerve and visual pathways, which will obviously take us through subcortical and cortical um, areas of the brain. So we've already covered cranial neuropathies 3, 4, and 6, and also um, disorders of the pupil. And so this lecture will really focus on two areas, visual loss and loss of visual function. And so just to quickly go through here different lesions along the visual pathway. And so we really want to think about visual loss in terms of either anterior to the chiasm, at the chiasm, or posterior to the chiasm. And so if we have a lesion anterior to the chiasm, either optic nerve um, or optic nerve head or the retina, then we're going to have monocular visual loss. So here with our lesion on the left, the patient will lose vision in the left eye. If we go back to the chiasm, then classically we'll have this bitemporal hemianopia. Come back to the optic tract because the rotation of the visual fibers is taking pl place here in the optic tract. Classically, like with here, a lesion of the right optic tract, the patient, um, as they're looking at the screen here, is going to have um, a visual field defect on the opposite side, of course, but it's usually incongruous. All right, so this would be a contralateral incongruous homonymous hemianopia. Now, if we have a lesion here of the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, remember the vascular supply here is anterior choroidal and posterior choroidal artery. And so the most important one to know about here is the anterior choroidal artery stroke. Um, we'll explain the full syndrome um, in the stroke lecture, but this involves this portion here of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so the patient will lose vision here in the red and blue areas, but it will spare this central area. So we have a central beak-like sparing of vision. And so that visual loss is pretty distinctive um, here of an anterior choroidal artery stroke. Okay, if the posterior choroidal artery is affected, then we'll just get, the, get that little wedge shaped uh, right there. And of course, in the anterior choroidal artery stroke, they have hemiplegia and some other things that um, would um, help to, you know, solidify that diagnosis. Now, if we have a problem here with the um, optic radiations as they go through the temporal lobe, this is called the Myers loop, um, then the patient will have a visual loss in the contralateral superior quadrant. And uh, because the optic radiations here, fewer of them go through um, the uh, temporal lobe, it's smaller, so it's a little bit of a pie in the sky. It's a little bit less than a quadrant if the lesion is in the temporal lobe. Whereas if we have a more of a parietal lobe lesion, then it will occupy a little more than a quadrant. But notice the visual deficits are equal side to side with both of these, right? So once we get behind the uh, optic tract and into the optic radiations, basically the further back you go, the more likely the visual field deficits will be perfectly equal and symmetrical side to side. All right, and if we get back here to the occipital lobe, remember the posterior cerebral artery is the vascular supply here. And so if we have more of the superior portion or the superior bank of the occipital lobe involved, then the patient will have a lower quadrant that is affected, but it's going to spare macular vision Okay, and if the lower portion, the inferior bank, um, so again, a PCA stroke, but smaller is involved, then the patient will have a superior quadrant affected, but will have macular sparing. And if we have a complete posterior cerebral artery stroke, uh, which we can see here, then the patient will have a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, hemianopia, um, and we may see that uh, macular sparing. Anytime you see macular sparing, you'd want to go for posterior cerebral artery stroke. 
All right, so a little of the anatomy. Here we see the optic nerves, the optic chiasm. Remember the pituitary sits right below. And then here we have the optic tract. Okay, and if we do a little cutting here, we can see the optic tract fibers going into the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So remember this nucleus um, is for vision and it has kind of a Napoleon's hat shape. And from the lateral geniculate, we can follow the optic radiations going back here to the um, occipital lobe and striate cortex. All right, now this one drawing here really has uh, just a gold mine of information that we're going to go through quickly. And uh, I'm mainly going to point out here the normal vascular supply of the optic nerve um, uh, chor choroid, the optic nerve head, the retina. So off of the internal carotid artery, we have the ophthalmic artery. All right, and from the ophthalmic artery, uh, we have um, here the posterior ciliary arteries, and we can see that supplies the optic nerve. Okay, and then notice that off of the posterior ciliary arteries, we have this um, just an anastomosis here right around the optic nerve head. And this is called the circle of Zinn Haller. Okay, so this will be important. We'll come back to that. Here we have the central retinal artery, okay, which we could just follow this through and we can see that um, uh, this supplies here the uh, retina. Okay, so we'll talk about occlusions of uh, specific blood vessels and uh, visual deficits. Um, I just want to point out also that the subarachnoid space um, here continues around the optic nerve. And so we'll talk about what happens when there's increased intracranial pressure. And that pressure gets transmitted here through the subarachnoid space uh, up to the optic nerve head. Okay, so we'll cover all these conditions, but um, I did just want to mention here that when we think about optic neuritis, that optic neuritis usually involves the posterior portion of the optic nerve here. So that's why you know, the patient can't see, right? But when you look in the eye, you don't see much. You don't see anything. Um, and that's because the problem is back here. All right, so let's start with uh, central retinal artery occlusion. Okay, so remember the central retinal artery here comes off the ophthalmic. And so these patients have painless sudden onset visual loss in one eye and so you will find an afferent pupillary defect and the classic finding here is a cherry red spot. If the uh, occlusion is more proximal of the ophthalmic um, artery here, all right, then the patient of course will still have visual loss but they're not going to have the um, cherry red spot. Amaurosis fugax, of course, is a transient ischemic attack, which almost always is retinal emboli from the um, internal carotid artery. And so this can um, either involve ischemia to the retina or to the optic nerve or both. And so classically here, patients have like a mist, a loss of vision in one eye that clears up after a few minutes. And so if you hear that story, a painless visual loss that kind of you know, like a mist clears and it comes back to normal, uh, be very important that you get a carotid ultrasound because most likely um, it's uh, emboli from the carotid. Now, in terms of the optic nerve, um, again, here's just another uh, really nice drawing of this. So here's the subarachnoid space. We can see on either side of the optic nerve. And so if you have increased intracranial pressure, um, from a variety of causes, there is very little uh, place for that pressure to go. So the, one of the areas is it goes just transmitted forward to the optic nerve head. And so this disrupts axoplasmic flow. We get axonal swelling. And so uh, this is always uh, bilateral with just a, a rare exception. So patients can have bilateral, uh, you know, to see papilla edema in one eye, would be virtually unheard of. Again, there's an exception, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So if we have a mass lesion from a tumor, hydrocephalus, a venous sinus occlusion, like maybe of the superior sagittal sinus, or pseudotumor, which remember is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, 
Uh, these would all be uh, some of the more common causes of um, uh, papilledema through this mechanism. Okay, so again, here we can see this, uh, you know, increased pressure being transmitted here around the optic nerve and the optic nerve head. And if you do an MRI scan of the orbits, you can actually see um, that um, uh, increased pressure there th through the subarachnoid space. And so patients that have papilledema frequently have what are called transient visual obscurations. And so this often relates to head movement. They bend over to tie their shoes, and there's increased pressure right there at the optic nerve head. So when they bend over, they get that shifting pressure may cause them to go blind um, for a period of time. So that story, if you hear that, would be quite concerning. And of course, they'll have, may have other symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, like um, headache, drowsiness, um, nausea, and vomiting. Of all cranial nerves, um, likely to be affected with increased intracranial pressure outside of the optic nerve, it would be the sixth nerve, which has a very long course, and so they may have a bilateral sixth nerve palsy. Um, visual acuity in papilledema is preserved until late, so you would not want to rely on a visual acuity, certainly, to exclude papilledema. And if we do uh, visual field testing here, oftentimes uh, papilledema may cause uh, tunnel vision, so kind of a constriction of vision, and the blind spot here is larger in papilledema. Okay, so if we're, you know, getting this story, we'd always want to do an MRI, and typically an MR venogram along with it. Okay, and if, you know, you're not finding anything there, then you would need to do a lumbar puncture, um, like for pseudotumor cerebri, to look for increased um, opening pressure. Okay, so just a reminder here that a bilateral six nerve palsy is common when there's increased intracranial pressure. So you don't see much here with the eyes in primary gaze, but the patient looks to the right, and we don't get abduction of the right eye. The patient looks to the left, we don't get abduction of the left eye. So bilateral six nerve palsy should always make you think of increased intracranial pressure. All right, optic neuritis, as I mentioned, it's usually the posterior portion of the optic nerve. So the rule is the patient sees nothing and you see nothing. You see nothing abnormal. Um, but the visual loss tends to be a central scotoma. Uh, there's almost always a significant loss of color vision. That's called dyschromatopsia. And patients will have an afferent pupillary defect, which we covered um, in the brainstem uh, section. Okay, over time, we get atrophy of the optic nerve head. That's called optic nerve pallor. All right, ischemic optic neuropathy, we want to divide into two parts. The first is non-arteritic or non-vasculitic ischemic optic neuropathy. And so this is a stroke. So just like a stroke, patients have frequently diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, they smoke, and so on. And so the ischemia does tend to involve the um, anterior portion um, here um, of the optic nerve, the optic nerve head, and so we get an abnormal eye exam. Frequently, patients wake up with this, and especially if they have sleep apnea. And so the blood pressure is lower, so some nocturnal hypotension, and then they have sleep apnea, so their oxygen's going down, and so that involves... Uh, dysregulation here of this anastomosis around the optic nerve head. So there's ischemia that occurs in that situation. And so they wake up with visual loss. There's no pain. Okay. And classically, now the whole eye may, may be involved, but classically is it is altitudinal. So there's a, a watershed area right here at the optic nerve head. And so it would more likely involve the um, superior portion um, of the optic nerve head. Therefore, the visual loss tends to be lower. So if someone comes in with this sort of an altitudinal visual field loss, it's most likely um, ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, the arteritic form is associated with giant cell arteritis. That's the one you know, important relationship there. So that can be altitudinal. It can be all different types of visual loss. And um, this is the, the one that uh, can often be bilateral, so patients are losing vision in both eyes. So we always want to rule out uh, giant cell arteritis or arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy 
in older individuals that have uh, sudden visual loss. And we'd be especially primed if they're also having headaches. And remember, jaw claudication is the most specific feature of um, giant cell arteritis. Two-thirds of patients have that. And oftentimes, they'll have polymyalgia rheumatica, diffuse aches, pains, myalgias, maybe even low-grade fever. All right, so these are patients who need a sed rate, a C-reactive protein, and a temporal artery biopsy. And you'd want to put them on um, steroids to prevent visual loss. Next, we have Leber hereditary optic neuropathy. So this is actually the first human disease linked to mitochondrial DNA mutation. So this is uh, inherited from uh, women. Only 50% have a, a positive family history. So many of these are spontaneous uh, mutations. So the story is these are younger men who have subacute painless visual loss in both eyes. Okay. And um, so, you know, rather sad condition because it tends to progress uh, fairly rapidly. And again, this is maternally transmitted. And so if you have a patient with Leber hereditary optic neuropathy, um, you can reassure that individual that there's no chance of their children developing this. Okay, so again, frequently it's a new mutation. Most women that have the mutation have no visual symptoms. Now, coming back to the optic chiasm, we talked about the classic bitemporal visual field loss. There's a mnemonic, SACHMO, uh, af uh, that was a nickname for Louis Armstrong. And so there's a whole bunch of things that can cause this, but I think the one you should know for sure is a pituitary adenoma. Maybe cranial pharyngioma uh, would be another. All right, so again, it's a bitemporal visual field loss. Remember the close relationship here between the optic chiasm and the pituitary. Okay, and so there are a whole bunch of other things. I mean, the internal carotid artery is not that far away. Um, we can have gliomas off of the optic nerve that can grow back to the optic chiasm. And here's a picture of a cranial pharyngioma that is uh, situated near the optic chiasm. All right, when we get back to the optic radiations, I'll say more about middle cerebral artery stroke, um, but that middle cerebral artery supplies the optic radiation, so frequently we'll have that contralateral homonymous hemianopsia with an MCA stroke. Any mass tumor involving the optic radiations um, can cause this visual field deficit. I want to just mention two others, though. PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, of course, related to the JC virus in conditions of immunosuppression, especially patients that have AIDS. Um, but also there are certain medications that can cause this. And uh, the, the one for neurology to know about is natalizumab, a very effective medication for multiple sclerosis. But PML usually starts in the posterior white matter, so in the optic radiation. So the early symptoms tend to be uh, contralateral visual loss. Okay, and of course, this is a condition that spreads, has a very poor um, prognosis. And so oftentimes we'll do a um, biopsy, of course, here at autopsy, what you would see is really just very prominent degeneration um, here of the white matter. Okay, and if we do a biopsy, what we're looking for are these glassy intranuclear uh, oligodendroglia inclusions. Press syndrome tends to involve the optic radiation. So remember, this is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. And so these are patients that come in with extremely high blood pressure or just a, a rapid change going from a normal to, um, you know, 180 over 120 or something like that. So the, the, how fast the blood pressure changes makes this more likely to occur. And this is uh, what this impairs is autoregulation. And so you really uh, alter the blood-brain barrier and you get swelling in the brain. And so hypertension, of course, but also we see this related to eclampsia and the use of cyclosporin. So patients come in because of the swelling with headaches and they're confused. I mean, they have increased intracranial pressure. If the cortical neurons are affected, they may have seizures, but they frequently have visual loss. And this can be profound to the point that they can really be blind entirely. And so here, notice the preferential swelling um, here in the posterior uh, white matter area. And so 
probably reflecting you know, significant right hemisphere involvement. These patients can have what's called Anton syndrome, where they're blind, but they deny that they're blind. All right, we get back to the occipital lobe. I mentioned a PCA stroke with macular sparing. And I just want to point out here that the macular fibers really are right back here at the tip um, of the occipital lobe. Okay, so if we have trauma, um, someone hits the back of their head, you know, they may get this bilateral uh, sort of paracentral homonymous hemianopia. All right, so here is a, a case of head trauma um, here that affected the tip of the right occipital lobe. And so they have this central uh, left visual field deficit. Okay, and then briefly, let's talk about some dysfunction of visual um, function. So our extra striate lesions. The striate is the primary visual cortex. So now we're talking about how the brain processes vision. And so, um, of course, when vision comes back here to the occipital lobe, the processing of that vision needs to go to other areas of the brain. So occipital lobe connections with the temporal lobe um, are important for the what of vision, identifying it, and also identifying the color. Whereas occipital lobe parietal lobe connections um, are the where of vision, identifying things in space. Okay, there is another extra striate lesion called alexia without agraphia, but I'm going to cover that in the stroke lecture. And so this part is not important. I just kind of want to give you the big sense that the what and where of vision is completely segregated from the optic nerve all the way back to the occipital cortex. So again, I don't think these details are important, but there's an M pathway and a P pathway. And the point is, as we go back to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then back to the occipital lobe, it's all completely categorized. So when it arrives in the occipital lobe, then um, it is just the continuation to either the temporal or the parietal lobe is just a continuation of what's been going on from the retina all the way back. Okay, so again, the what of vision um, from the occipital lobe goes to the temporal lobe. And there's this uh, occipital temporal gyrus or a fusiform gyrus here that would be important in that connection. And so this is important for recognizing things, faces, letters, symbols, objects, and also for identifying colors. All right, and so since lesions here, they tend to be, um, need to be bilateral really to impair the what of vision. So if you have half of your occipital temporal lobe connections working, you're probably not gonna have any deficits, deficits. But if it's bilateral, then we'll have some dysfunction. So bilateral lesions here, because they're more inferior, would tend to produce this kind of a visual field um, in the superior quadrants here in both eyes. Okay, so here's a patient we can see on a CT that has an occlusion of the basilar artery. And so remember the posterior cerebral arteries come off of that, go back to the occipital lobe. So we can see some early ischemia here in the occipital temporal gyri or the fusiform gyrus. There is some early ischemia over here. And so this patient is losing the what of vision. And so they would have a great difficulty identifying shapes and colors. All right, so we'll show them something like this. They wouldn't be good with colors um, and would have difficulty even distinguishing between, you know, a heart and a square and a triangle. Um, I like to ask patients if they, you know, know anything about cars, show them some pictures, and frequently patients will just say, you know, they all kind of look the same. Can't tell the difference. Uh, prosopagnosia is a specific type of visual agnosia where patients can't identify faces. Okay, and so the, they can be really good recognizing tone of voice, but the faces just, um, you know, people don't look familiar. And so we'll show them celebrity pictures, um, or if someone's really into sports, we'll show them the picture of, you know, if they like the Lakers, a uh, famous athlete on that team. And uh, they'll just be really poor at uh, recognizing. I can tell you probably everything about Kobe Bryant uh, if they've had this type of uh, lesion, but uh, won't be able to recognize the picture. All right, and then finally, if we have 
Um, again, usually bilateral lesions that affect occipital lobe parietal lobe connections. This is the wear of vision. And so now we have problem with motion and spatial relationships. So here's a patient, um, I believe, with uh, press syndrome. So we see some bilateral um, um, optic radiation lesions are more superior. So again, this would impair occipital lobe, parietal lobe connections on both sides. And so these patients can have what's known as Balance syndrome. Okay, and the first part of that is optic ataxia. And this is difficulty localizing things in space. Again, they don't have the wear of vision. So when they try to reach for something in space, they can. it looks sort of like a cerebellar ataxia. You can distinguish it, however, from a cerebellar ataxia because if you ask them, take your finger and touch your nose, or your chin, or your knee, they're very coordinated. So that's not a problem. It's only a problem with respect to visually being able to identify things. Okay, so they have optic ataxia. Not surprisingly, they also have difficulty moving their eyes with respect to finding things in space. And so if you're just having them track your finger or your pen, they're quite poor at that. If they try to look at things in the room, they often need to blink their eyes to sort of force their eyes to look in a certain direction. So this really isn't the best term, but it's called an oculomotor apraxia. And then finally, because of they've lost the wear um, of vision, um, they have a real hard time just looking at something and taking it all in. And that's called uh, simultagnosia, um, which is really a lack of global capture. And it's amazing how good we are at this normally, being able to take in a whole room and pretty quickly um, putting everything together. And so this is a very outdated picture, but it's still what neurologists use. Uh, we need to come up with something a little more modern here. But we'll show patients a picture of this. And, you know, a normal person very quickly can say, you know, well, the water is uh, flowing here over the sink and this boy is about to fall and get hurt trying to get a cookie. Uh, but someone that has um, Balance syndrome will just be able to pick out a little bit and patients that I've seen with this will say it looks like a mother is washing the dishes or a woman is washing the dishes. And you'll ask, well, do you see anything else? And they'll scan with great difficulty and they might be able to pick out something else, but they can't put the whole thing together. Um, another helpful thing is just to show them some of these uh, paintings where faces are made out of fruit. So a patient with simultagnosia or a Balance syndrome you know, they'll pick out an onion, but they won't be able to see that all of the vegetables or fruit or whatever are put together uh, in a way that makes up a face. Okay, we'll stop there.